We invited the White House to send a representative to discuss the new policy on Syria, but they declined. Now, to talk more about the next steps for the U.S., we're joined by George Will, Jeffrey Goldberg of The Atlantic, Jeremy Bash, former chief of staff to both the CIA director and the secretary of defense, and my colleague, ABC's chief global affairs correspondent, Martha Raddatz. George, not long ago, you said the president is right on Syria. Now what? Now he's wrong. Uh, two axioms from two great military leaders. Napoleon said, if you start to take Vienna, take Vienna. That is, don't be tentative whatever else you do. And don't be tardy. General MacArthur said, every military debacle can be explained by two words, too late. Too late to discern the threat, to prepare for the threat, to respond to the threat. This intervention in another nation's civil war with sectarian overlays and ethnic complications was announced not by the president, not in conjunction with Congress, was announced by the Deputy National Security Advisor. This is obviously a reluctant president who now has himself in a competition with the Russians who are all in supporting the other side. We want to have negotiations. We're not neutral. The president has said Assad lacks legitimacy and Assad must go. So the negotiations are to negotiate Assad's departure from power. I don't think he's interested. Okay, you're saying the president's wrong because you didn't think we should get in there. Jeffrey, you, you've been for a, a, a long time saying that the administration, that the U U.S. needs to get involved, needs to arm the rebels and do more. Now? Well, I, I agree with George. This is the worst of all possible worlds. This is, this is uh, dipping a toe in. Uh, this is signaling that we're in, but we're not really in. No one believes, including the president, I believe, no one believes that these small arms are going to change the balance of this, of this war. I don't think Hezbollah, I don't think the Iranians are sitting there going, oh, look, uh, the Americans are sending eight trucks of small weapons to the, to the rebels. We better give up. So, so what I'm saying is either be in or be out, but, but don't, don't, don't play around around in this. I, I think that we're going to find that we might be on the slippery slope, and I happen to agree that it might be too late. We're now in a position to intervene in what has become a Hezbollah al-Qaeda war. And I don't know, I don't know the answer to who do you support in that. I think neither party is, is the party you well, support. Well, Jeremy, you're just out of the administration. You were at the Pentagon when a lot of these uh, deliberations were going on. Uh, we, we know it, it, Far, far, it seems like a long time ago now, Secretary Panetta, uh, Petraeus, uh, who was CIA director at the time, Hillary Clinton, Secretary of State, all made the case for arming the rebels. That was a long time ago. Is it too late now? Well, John, two things have changed in recent weeks. First, the in intelligence community came forward with a comprehensive assessment that said they have high confidence that Assad used sarin gas, chemical weapons, to kill 100 to 150 people of his own people. Assad didn't just fifty out of ninety thousand. Assad didn't people. just walk up to the red line, look both ways, and tiptoe across. He barreled across the red line. We had set the red line, and now the president has determined we have to act. And second, three weeks ago, Hezbollah announced that they're going to join this fight and fight on Syria's behalf to the death. Now, I've been in these rooms, John, when these issues have been discussed. The president is not hesitant to order military forces into harm's way. He did it in Afghanistan, he did it in Libya, and he did it deep into Pakistan to get Osama bin Laden. But he has but, been reluctant on this. But he's been careful. What he wants to ensure is that our military objectives meet a strategy. And now is the right time to arm the rebels. Martha. I, I, I'm not sure I know what the strategy is and how those two match, because the small arms are frankly not going to do much good at all. They may not do any harm, but they're not going to do much good. It will not change the balance there. If the president really wants to make a difference there, and, and you talk about military force, I doubt he's going to send in boots on the ground ever, and they've made that very clear. But if we are in, and it really does appear we're on a little slide in. You really can't put your toe in, a water, in the water in something like this. You now own, even if it's just a toe, you own part of that. If you want to make a bigger difference, they really do have to look at a no-fly zone. Now, they're going to leave F-16s behind. They're going to leave Patriot missile batteries behind in Jordan after some U.S. military exercises that are taking place over there. A no-fly zone would be a very big deal. <clears throat> we talk about the number of casualties over there and that very few of them are from airstrikes, but because Assad has air power, because he has the mobility, because he can resupply his troops, because he can move his troops around by air, he has a huge advantage. 
Will the United States do that next? Will someone else do that next? We don't know, but that would probably be a huge game changer. Because if you want a war of attrition and you don't have air power and you don't have protection against air power, you're going to lose. That's going to be a tough sell at the Pentagon, right? Yeah, I but, mean, the but, military leadership doesn't But, John, work. of course these are imperfect options. Thank you for pointing that out. We understand that. That's why this has been very difficult. But when you're in that room hearing the arguments on both sides, and you see the evidence, the concrete evidence that he used chemical weapons, you have to act. But was it really about chemical weapons? There was more to it than that. There it, were, the, first of all, Assad forces are much, much stronger now. And in the last few months, they've really started to take back areas. The As Washington said, Post reported this week that this decision to intervene was made before the, the conclusion came, was arrived at about chemical weapons. Second, even if they did use chemical weapons to kill one fraction of 1% of the 93,000 have been killed there. How does that change our national interest? George W. Bush undertook two exercises in regime change in Iraq and Afghanistan. Libya now, followed by Syria, two regime change exercises by the Obama administration. And there's no denying that regime change has to be the outcome here, which is why poor John Kerry, the Secretary of State, is out there trying to get a conference together as though there's a congruence of interest between the Russians and the United States. There isn't. We're on opposite sides. And we know, more, we know that more than ever right now exactly. because of this. One of the reasons that a lot of people like me who were hawkish, I think, early on are less hawkish now is because this problem might have become too big for any country to handle. Uh, I, I mean, let's look so, at so let's look at Iraq. Mean? I mean, you're mean? talking about you're talking about a global Shia Sunni conflict playing out on the Syrian battlefield. You're talking about Hezbollah and Al Qaeda battling it out in the Syrian battlefield. How do we interpose ourselves into that? All the more, no fly the zone. No fly zone yeah. is not going to be enough. What's all the, the goal? all the more reason why we just can't stand back. We have to get engaged. The goal is to change the balance of power on the battlefield. You know, there's a lot of talk about no-fly zones and airstrikes. 95% of the casualties have been from ground operations. We have to give the opposition, which is now better organized under General Idris, more of a chance to take it to the Assad regime. So heavier weapons? I mean, do you give them heavier weapons? Because you're not going to change the Direct balance Direct military with support. Arms. That's the key. And, and but, as I understand, but these small weapons, arms is not even these small the arms are going to take months uh, together. Hey, we're almost out of time. I, I've got to ask about uh, Jeffrey. The, the elections in Iran has this changed the calculus at all? We now have a so-called moderate. Uh, being elected president? Look, essentially, this is a, a, a fake election and a fake democracy. Let's not kid ourselves about what we're dealing with here. These are, these are hand-picked candidates by the Supreme Leader who are running for president. That said, this guy is a smoother operator. He does seem more moderate in his economic approach. He does seem less confrontational. But remember, the, the leader of Iran is the Supreme Leader. I mean, they call him Supreme Leader for I a reason. Allah, it's yeah. a nice title, <laughs> yeah. right? Uh, he's the Supreme Leader. He sets national security policy. He sets foreign policy. He sets nuclear policy. So so let's not forget where the power lies in that country. Okay, uh, just one more thing. Jeremy, because you're here, I've got to ask you about to the NSA and, and the search for Edward Snowden. Take a look at what he said uh, to the China Morning Post. He said, people think I made a mistake in picking Hong Kong as a location, misunderstand my intentions. I am not here to hide from justice. I am here to reveal criminality. How worried is the intelligence community that he is effectively going to defect to China or China uh, we'll get a hold of whatever else he has. Very, very worried. Every day he's in China, John, I think erodes his claim that he's a whistleblower. The information he has in his head and maybe on his person or on his computer or on his thumb drive is very valuable to the Chinese. They're very interested in it. If they haven't exploited it already, I suspect they soon will be. All right. Unfortunately, we're out of time. Martha, Jeremy, Jeffrey, George, thank you very much for joining us.